Okay, welcome back to everyone. Now for this second talk of uh, MOVED 20, we have uh, Marco Iwa talking us about Milner excision for motivic spectra. And I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to forgot to mute everyone and unmute Mark. Okay. Okay, so the screen sharing is working. Okay. Um, right, so I'm gonna tell you about Milner excision for motivic spectra, which is um, joint work uh, with Eldon Almanto, Ryome Iwasa, and Shane Kelly. Um, so what is this about? Um, so let me define it for you. So um, a million square of community rings is um, a Cartesian square where um, one of the map is a subjection. So it looks like this, A, B, A mod I, B mod I. Um, so it's a Cartesian square of rings like this, um, where the vertical maps are subjective. And I use the same name I for the ideal because the Cartesian-ness of the square tells me that these, these ideals are isomorphic. Um, <clears throat> And uh, well, you could also consider this for non commutative rings, but in my talk, all rings will be commutative. Um, and um, we, we say that a functor on rings or on schemes um, satisfies Milner excision um, if it sends such squares to Cartesian squares. So it sends Milner squares to Cartesian squares. Um, so I yeah, often classically this property is just called excision, um, but the word excision is also used for a bunch of other things, especially in motivic chemotherapy theory. So we call that Milner excision just uh, to, to be clear. So what are some examples of this phenomenon? Um, so our first example, which is worth noting, is that any functor which is uh, represented by a scheme satisfies mean excision. So let me, so if you look at um, the set of maps from blank into some scheme X, Um, this is a functor that satisfies Milner excision, and if you unpack what this means, it means that if you look at this Cartesian square of rings and you take spec, it's going to be a co-Cartesian square in the category of schemes. This is what this means. So um, the first recorded proof of this fact I could find is in a paper by Ferrand. And um, so another example is you look at the functor which sends a scheme to the category of vector bundles on that scheme, um, or the infinity category of perfect complexes. So both of these functors also satisfy this mean excision property. Um, so the case of vector bundles is essentially the original, um, the original case uh, due to Milner, where he introduced this notion of squares. And uh, the case of perfect complexes is due to Lurie. Um, so these are already kind of interesting examples. I mean, they're not particularly hard to prove, but um, it's a bit subtle because um, this is not true if you don't put any finiteness assumptions on you. Like if instead of vector bundles, you look at all quasi carrion sheaves, for example, then this does not satisfy mean excision. And it's so similarly, if you look at the whole stable infinity category of quasi coherent sheaves that does not satisfy mean excision either. So it's not a completely trivial result. Um, then, um, right, so another example is a uh, homotopy invariant algebraic K-theory. Um, so it's due to Weibull. Um, and also um, related example is what is now denoted K-inv. So this is a fiber of the cyclotomic trace, the 
as you know, these kinds of things. So this, the fact that this satisfies mean excision is a theorem of band and tam. Um, from uh, well, a very recent theorem, maybe from last year, I'm not sure. And uh, finally, if you look at a tal homology with torsion coefficients, or did this way, R gamma x et al um, coefficients in A, where A is a torsion abelian group. Uh, so this is an excision and is a theorem of Bat and Matthew. Okay, Mark, can I interrupt you? There is a question. Yes, please. A shahar. So in example two, what is the type of the target? It's the groupoid or the category or? Um, so for VECT, is the, the target would be the two category of categories. Okay, thank you. And for perf X, the infinity category of stable infinity categories, for example. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, Right, so this is a list of known examples of this phenomenon, and um, I want to draw to your attention to the last two here, uh, which might uh, make you think of motivic homotopy theory, because both of these examples, at least um, if the torsion in this abelian group if, is prime to the residual characteristics, um, then these cohomology theories here are represented in the stable motivic homotopy category. Um, right. So now let me uh, move on to this to this setting. So suppose I have some scheme S and some motivic spectrum in SH of S. So this is my notation for the stable motivic category. Um, yeah, so just to remind you, I mean, in his talk, Tom uh, defined the unstable motivic category and this uh, stable version is just um, the infinity category of P1 spectra in the unstable one. Okay, so given these things, um, one can associate to this a cohomology theory, which I'll denote gamma length with coefficients in E. There's gonna be a functor, there's gonna be a pre-sheaves on S schemes with values in spectra. And what it does is, um, all right, so if you have some S, if you have some S scheme X, what is this spectrum? Is going to be the mapping spectrum um, from the unit object to the base change of E inside the stable homotopy category over X, right? Um, so yeah, for example, so both the example three and four above uh, with this condition on the torsion, um, would be example of this procedure. So for example, KH of a scheme X is gamma of X with coefficient in the motivic spectrum KGL, which is defined with respect Z. Um, there is a similar fact you can write down for, material, for a tal cohomology. All right, so um, now the main theorem is um, the following for any such E, this cohomology theory also satisfies the mean excision. So for any scheme S and any, um, um, material spectrum over S, this gamma with coefficients in E satisfies mean excision. All right. Um, yeah, so the goal of the talk will be to kind of sketch um, various ingredients going into the proof of this theorem. And um, in fact, what we prove, even though this might be the more interesting statement, we actually prove a stronger result, which implies this, um, which is that if you look at SH itself, as a pre sheaf of infinity categories and schemes, this satisfies me next season. All 
Um, so that's a strictly stronger result because of the fact that, right, so this gamma is defined by taking some mapping spaces in SH and mapping spaces in the limit of, of categories are the limit of the mapping spaces. So this category, this categorified statement implies uh, a statement for every multiple spectrum. Um, all right. And there's basically two steps in the previous theorem. There's a first step, which is a general criterion for Milner excision. So in other words, reduce this Milner excision condition to something simpler. Um, and the second step is to check this criterion for SH. Um, so let me um, state this criterion. Um, And so this is a variant of a theorem of Bat and Matthew. Um, and well, I already explained exactly what the difference is between, between our result and their result. Um, okay, so let's um, see. the uh, compactly generated infinity category. For, for example, um, the infinity category of spaces or that of spectra. Um, and F, uh, C-valued pre-sheave and schemes. Um, a finitary CDH sheave. Okay, so there are some words in the statement which I, I will explain um, afterwards. Um, then the following equivalent. Um, okay. The question? Yeah, there is a question. Uh, okay, uh, in, it's about example two. So. A perf, perf satisfies Milner excision, as you said. So why doesn't this imply that K theory satisfies Milner excision? And well, right, um, yeah, it does not, and this is in fact the false. Um, I mean, because so perf, this means that if I apply perf to this square here, I get a Cartesian square of infinity categories. But K theory does not preserve Cartesian square of infinity categories. Yeah. Well, it does in some very special conditions, but not, not in this generality. I mean, it preserves some, it's a, some kind of version of excision. It preserves Cartesian squares where the vertical arrows are Verdier projections. Yes, precisely. And this is not the case here. Yeah. So this uh, use map and perf here from A to the quotient is not going to be a localization. Okay. You know. Uh, answers the, the question of the asker. Um, all right, so the following equivalent and the first condition is F satisfies immune excision. And the second condition um, uh, is gonna be simpler, but also more complicated to write. So uh, for every Um, Hanselian valuation ring V um, of finite rank. Um, and every prime ideal in this valuation ring. Um, the following square is Cartesian. So I can apply F to V to the localization of V at P, to the quotient of V by P, and to the residue field at P. So this square is Cartesian. Um, right, so this uh, condition involving valuation ring is also called V excision. 
All right. Uh, right. So before I move on, uh, right, I need to define some things. So um, what does finitary mean? So finitary means um, that the pre sheaf preserves filtered co limits of rings. Uh, so, so this is sometimes called the locally finitely presented for a functor like this. And uh, so the CDH topology um, is the topology which is generated by the Nisnevich topology and then um, uh, the kind of proper analog of the Nisnevich topology which is completely decomposed families of uh, proper maps, so completely decomposed families of, in fact, finitely presented proper maps. All right, so completely decomposed means that uh, every point um, has a lift with the same residue field. Yeah, so it's the same condition as in the Nisnevich topology. So the Nisnevich topology is generated by completely decomposed families of etal maps. All right, um, what else? Yeah, so I will say something about valuation rings in a second. And um, right, so uh, what Bat and Matthew, they had a version of the CRM with the H topology instead of the CDH topology. Um, that doesn't really make a difference in the proof. I mean, also, instead of Hanselian valuation ring, if you have an H sheaf, you can weaken that to absolutely integrally closed valuation ring. Um, but the main difference with their theorem is that they had, well, they needed uh, additional assumption on the category C, some kind of boundedness assumption. So their theorem uh, would only imply this one if the category C is something like, uh, well, if it's an N category for some finite end, for example, or if it's something like the category of co-connective spectra, but it would not work for the category of spaces or the category of spectra. So this is really the main, um, uh, improvements on this theorem and this makes use of the good finiteness properties of the CDH topology. So I'll come back to this. Um, okay, so... I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah. what, what you mean by Henselian ring of finite rank? Yeah, so I, I'm gonna explain this as well. Yeah. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Fact right now, so, I, so we recall what the valuation ring is. Um, yeah. So evaluation ring is an integral domain um, where the divisibility relation is a total order. Okay, I mean, that's one of the many equivalent definitions you could give for evaluation ring. Um, and uh, I know that this implies, so if you have some prime ideal in such a valuation ring, then um, if you look at the map to the extending ideal in the localization, um, this map will be bijective. And so the, the, the injectivity of this map is just because it's an integral domain and this divisibility condition, you can easily check from this that this map will be subjective. Now, of course, you wouldn't, this map would not be subjective for general ring, but it is for valuation ring. And what this is saying is that, um, is that if you look at this square here of rings, it's actually a Milner square. Yeah, so the, the vertical fiber, the fibers of the vertical quotient maps um, are isomorphic. Um, so, so if this proof that one implies two, yeah, two is just a, a special case of one, it's a very special case of, of condition one. Um, right, so divisibility is a total order. From this, you can easily deduce that, in fact, uh, all the, the ideals are totally ordered under inclusion. In particular, if you look at the spectrum um, of a valuation ring, Oops. So it looks like a sequence of points. 
like this. So you have the generic points and uh, the maximal ideal in particular, you see that it's a local ring yeah, in this condition. And uh, you have it, so a specialization like this. So the arrows denote specialization of a point to another. Um, and if you have some, uh, some prime here, so the localization at P is um, this part here. That is the spectrum of the localization at P and the spectrum of the quotient is this part here. Um, and so the fact that this is a Milner square tells you that the, the spectrum of V as a scheme is obtained as a push out of the spectrum of V mod P and the spectrum of V localized at P along the residue field at P. So this is really, this picture is a, is a push out situation of schemes. Okay, so what, what is the rank? So the rank is, rank of V is just the length of this specialization chain. Yeah. So in this picture, this is a rank four valuation ring. Um, so a finite rank for valuation ring means equivalently that there's finitely many points or the cruel dimension is finite. You could have some crazy valuation rings, which, you know, I mean, it's still gonna be a total order, but it could be infinite, but uh, we don't need to look at those. Okay, so are there any other questions on the statement of the theorem? Okay, um, so we, we're gonna apply basically the theorem to SH itself. And um, SH does have nice properties. In particular, it's a CDH sheaf. Yeah. Um, and um, so basically what this theorem does is it reduces the, the main theorem about SH to a question to understanding SH of these valuation rings. And so we, we, we're gonna wanna show that um, if F is SH, this is a Cartesian square of infinity categories. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm first going to talk about this theorem and sketch the proof of this theorem. And uh, I mean, if there is any time at the end, which I'm not sure there will be, I'll say something about why SH actually satisfy this V excision condition. Sure, sure. Um, okay. Okay. Sorry, Who's unmuted? Okay, let me mute everyone and unmute Mark again. Okay, you're unmuted. I don't know who was unmuted. Okay, so. Okay, so let's start now the proof of this theorem. So we've already seen that uh, two is a special case of one. So the goal is to show that you have a finitary CDH sheaf under this assumption, this V excision um, assumption, it actually satisfies the mean excision. <clears throat> Okay, so we start by looking at some uh, Milner square. Um, I'll so, uh, consider X a scheme away. And we're gonna consider the, uh, the, the kind of the gap map in this Cartesian square. So we'd like to show that F of this square is Cartesian. Uh, so we consider the map phi sub x from f of x to the pullback of the square, everything is base changed to x. So x tensor over a with b times f of x tensor over a with a mod i over f of x tensor over a with b mod i. Yeah, so we wanna show that this map is an isomorphism uh, well, when X is spec A, but uh, we're gonna prove more generally that it's an isomorphism for any X this way. 
Um, and now, what is this map? So this is a natural transformation in X, and it's a morphism between finite area CDA sheaves over A. So it's a morphism in, um, so finite area CDA sheaf on the category of A schemes. And uh, this uh, finite area condition, you can remove it by passing to schemes of finite presentation. So this is also the same as CDA sheaves on the category of A schemes of finite presentation, which is a nice um, infinity topos. Um, right, so the goal is to prove that this morphism is an equivalence. And how, how is V excision going to come into play? So um, a fact that I maybe should have mentioned earlier is that these Ancelian valuation rings here, they're precisely the points of the CDH topology. Same way that strictly Ancelian local rings are the points of the etal topology, for example. Um, so um, to prove that phi is a morphism, so one idea is to check that it's an equivalence on stocks. Yeah, so um, evaluate on uh, these Hanselian valuation rings. And this is indeed how the proof goes. So the first step will be to um, look what happens when you have a valuation ring um, of rank at most one. So rank at most one means it has one or two points. Yes, it's either field or um, a scheme with just two points. And so in this case, um, one can check that if you have any morphism from A into this valuation ring, it has to factor either through B or through A mod I. Right. Um, I mean, okay, so this is not supposed to be obvious by any means, so it's an observation of Pat and Matthew. Um, but, um, yeah, so I don't want to explain this in more detail, it's also very elementary, so it's a very short proof, but uh, so, you have to use the definition of a Milner square and the definition of a rank one valuation. Rank. I'm going to interrupt you, but I, yeah. there is a question that I'm pretty sure is giving up uh, the, 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 the secret topic of the talk. Tome Schlank is asking whether there are hundred completions. Wait. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if I, if I were to answer this now, it would be a spoiler. So. Yeah. Okay, no, 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 I don't, no spoilers, no spoilers, I'm sorry. I, I haven't watched the talk yet, so I didn't know. Yeah, it's good, yeah, you're paying attention, it's very good. Okay. Um, well, anyway, so this fact that the map to evaluation factor, so it's basically saying that the Milner square over evaluation ring of rank at most one is basically a split uh, in some, some sense. And then it's kind of formal in this situation that this map phi is going to be an isomorphism for evaluation ring of rank at most one. And then that's where this V excision comes in. So you see this V excision condition is basically some condition that allows you to reduce statements about valuation rings of finite ranks to, to the rank one case. Yeah? Because if you have a valuation ring of rank greater than one, you can break it up into two smaller ranks valuation ring and then use this V excision condition. Um, so using V excision, I mean, it's not, uh, again, it's not the immediate thing, but one can check that um, phi sub V is an ISO for V, a Hanselian valuation ring of finite rank. Okay. Uh, right, so now, well, we've already used the assumption, so we better hope that now we can conclude the proof on formal grounds. Sorry, Mark, uh, there is a, a question. Uh, yes. Patrick. Um, is there any way under like any assumption on the base where you can reduce further to the case where not only is the not not only are the uh, valuation rings rank one but also discrete? Um, I'm not really aware of uh, 
like excellent or, or being able to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question, yeah. but I don't think there's any general techniques that allow you to reduce a discrete case. All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, right, so now the main point is um, that in fact, I mean, so we could conclude if we know that these Zancelian valuation rings of finite rank were a conservative family of points for this infinity topos. Um, so this is certainly not going to be true in general. Um, and there's a theorem of Vyvodsky that, of Vyvodsky that says that this is the case um, if A was an Ethereum ring of finite full dimension. And now the issue is that um, um, A, well, A is not an Ethereum and uh, worse than that, A cannot be assumed to be an Ethereum. What you can do if you look at this original minimum square here, um, you can write these three rings here in the corner as filtered co-limits of rings of finite type over Z. Um, and our, our pre-shift F is finitary, so it commutes with that. So, so without loss of generality, um, we could assume that these three rings are a finite type over Z, in particular, no theory and finite cool dimension. Um, but this, but the A is always going to be the pullback, so we don't have any control as to what A is. And even under this assumption, A is usually not an Ethereum ring. Um, so basically, we're going to need to generalize this uh, theorem of Vyvodsky to a setting that applies to non-Ethereum rings, and in particular to this ring A that appears in this pullback square here. Um, Right. Um, so, and we can in fact do that. So this following theorem um, basically concludes the, the proof. Um, so let X be quasi-compact, quasi-separated scheme of finite um, valuative dimension. Okay, so I will tell you what that is afterwards. Um, then the infinity topos of uh, CDH sheaf, sheaves. On X schemes of finite presentation is hypercomplete. And um, so that means hypercompleteness means that you can check isomorphisms on stocks. And uh, sorry, this is not what it means now. It means that you can check isomorphism on homotopy sheaves. But on homotopy sheaves, these are just sheaves of sets. So you know that you can check isomorphisms on stocks yeah? because um, this, is a, this is a nice coherent topos like you always have in algebraic geometry. Um, so once you know this, you know that a morphism between CDH sheaves is an equivalence if and only if it is so when evaluated on Hanselian valuation rings. Um, and then, okay, um, you still need arbitrary Hanselian valuation rings a priori, but uh, also given the definition of valuative dimension, which I will give in a second, it's also easy to reduce to the case of um, Hanselian valuation rings of finite rank. So you get this conservative family of points, which allows you to conclude the proof. Ah, and also uh, uh, a relevant point is that in this, um, in this square here, if you assume that these three rings are a finite type of a Z, and this ring A, although not Noetherian, it will be a finite valuative range. So this theorem will apply to CDH sheaves on A. Um, okay. Any questions about this? So, um, okay, so I have to tell you what valuative dimension is. Um, and then um, 
I'll, I'll sketch something about the proof of um, this, this theorem here. Um, okay, so suppose X is an integral scheme. Um, I just have to introduce some terminology. So evaluation centered on X. Um, is evaluation ring in the fraction field. Oh, uh, the, the yeah, fraction field, I mean, the, I guess the function field, or yeah, it's an integral scheme, um, which contains, um, which contains some local ring of x, yeah, contains O x x for some, for some points, x and x. Um, and okay, now I can define the evaluative dimension. So this is a notion which was invented by Jafar in the 60s. Um, so you, you can define it first for X integral um, as follows. Uh, so the evaluative dimension is denoted d dim sub V of X. So if I didn't put the V here, I would mean the cruel dimension. Um, so this is a supremum of the length of chains of valuations centered on X. Um, right, so you have these valuation rings in the fraction field, so you can have chains under inclusion of such valuation rings, and it's the supremum of the lengths of such chains. Um, Right, so this is a, this is similar to the notion of full dimension, and, uh, except that prime ideals are replaced by evaluations. So every evaluation always determines a prime. I mean, determines a point in the scheme X, which is the center of the evaluation. So it's always centered at some specific point. Um, so there, there will be a relation between this and the cool dimension, which um, I explained later. Okay, first, uh, once you have this for integral scheme, you can also extend this to any scheme in a stupid way, namely, just take um, the supremum of the evaluative dimension of, of all um, integral closed sub schemes. Right. Okay, so at this point, you have to check that this is well-defined in the sense that if X was actually integral, this agrees with the previous definition, which is, um, which is not actually obvious, but this is one of the things that uh, Jafar proves. So this well defined. Okay, so let me just list some properties of this notion. Um, right, so X is any scheme. Mm, so the first is there's always an inequality with the cool dimension. So the valuative dimension of X is greater than or equal to the cool dimension of X. And there is equality if X is locally in Ethereum. Uh, Mark, can I ask you one question? Yes. I probably asked you before, but uh, for any scheme, uh, how different is this from the cruel dimension of the Zariski Riemann space? Um, you can define. I don't know what the Zariski Riemann space is for any scheme, but if you ask me this for an integral scheme, then it's the same. Yeah. Okay. Good. So that, that would also be another way to define it for an integral scheme. But. Yeah, no, my question was I mean, does this work also for any scheme so that it looks like a less ad hoc definition? Uh, but I guess I mean you can make it work by defining the the risky Riemann space in some way, but I'm not sure there's a good definition that is useful in this generality. I guess that's okay. If you don't have like frankly many generic points, or something. 
Very nice. Thank you. Um, right, so you should think of evaluative dimension as an extension of cool dimension to non Euclidean schemes, um, which has the following nice properties. So an important one is if you have a subscheme of X, then the evaluative dimension of Y cannot be greater than the evaluative dimension of X. So that's good. And in fact, um, this would be a strict inequality if um, Y does not contain any of the generic points of X. Um, well, I mean, it could be that both are infinite still. So I mean, strict has to be understood with that caveat. Um, I mean, you can imagine that this strict inequality is very useful for proofs by induction. And so third property is that the dimension of a n times x, oh, sorry, I should put s and b's. Hopefully I don't forget to put those. Um, is always the same as the evaluative dimension of x plus n. And so the last property I want to mention here is that if you have a proper birational map, um, then uh, the evaluative dimension is the same. Um, so as you may know, these two properties here are false for the cool dimension of non Euclidean scheme. Yeah, so if you have some non Euclidean schemes, the cool dimension of a fine space might be greater than you would want. And also it's possible to blow up a scheme and increase the cool dimension. Very strange, but um, this can happen. And uh, in fact, if you try to fix either one of these issues with the cool dimension, so you start with the notion of cool dimension and try to adjust it in such a way that either property three or property four holds, then you will, you will arrive at the notion of evaluative dimension. It's the, it's the minimal modification of cool dimension which has these properties. Um, okay. Wait a second, there's another question in the chat mm -hmm. um, from Tomer. Is there a simple prototypical example where the inequality in one is strict? Um, um, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have uh, such an example on the top of my head. But, um, there are many such examples and they're not particularly difficult to write down. I mean, for example, this fact that the, the cool dimension, I mean, take any example where you know the cool dimension of a polynomial ring is too large. It's easy to write down such a number, and the evaluative dimension will be strictly greater than the value for any such ring. So. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I mean, once we know these properties, we can basically forget about the definition of the evaluative dimension. We're only really going to use these properties here. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is somehow, I don't think it's a very well-known notion, but you know, if you ever find yourself having to work with some, some non Noetherian uh, rings or schemes, it might be a useful notion to have around. It's much better behaved than cool dimension for non Noetherian things. Okay. Um, right, so now remember this theorem, uh, here, yeah. so if you have a scheme of finite evaluative dimension, uh, we'd like to show that the infinity topos of CDH sheave is hypercomplete. Um, so let me, uh, yeah, so let me go now into basically the proof of this theorem. So um, first I recall some general notions of high topos theory that are relevant to this question. Um, so in particular, the notion of homotopy dimension of an infinity topos. 
x has um, homotopy dimension less than or equal to d if every um, d connective object has a global section um, yeah, so if you've never seen this definition before, let me just give you some, um, maybe some intuition or it's easy to see that this implies in particular that the cohomology um, of this infinity topos with coefficients in some sheaf A, it will vanish for n greater than D. So that's a consequence of this definition. Um, and this is actually easy to see. So if you take if you take some cohomology class here in Hn, so this is represented by some map from um, the final object in the topos to an, the Allenberg maclean sheaf Kan. So this is X or a representative of X. Um, and you also have the zero map, so the zero cohomology class. here and you can take the pullback. So let me call the pullback G of X. Uh, so this, this G of X is a gerb which is uh, classified by this cohomology class. And the point is because this allenberg maclean sheaf is, is N connective, this, this pullback, this gerb is N minus one connective. Is N minus one connective but because N was strictly greater than D, uh, the homotopy dimension condition tells us that there exists a section to this gerb. And I mean, sections of this pullback here are the same things as null homotopies of X. And so this shows that X is zero in this cohomology. Um, but this homotopy dimension less than equal to D condition is strictly stronger than this cohomological vanishing in general. Um, right, and then, so why do I mention this notion is because of the following proposition due to Lurie. Um, so if you have an infinity topos X, which is generated on the co-limits by um, objects U such that um, the homotopy dimension of U, which means the size topos or U, um, is finite, um, then X is hypercomplete. So this is how we're going to use, uh, well, this is how we're going to deduce the hypercompleteness of the CDH topos. Um, in fact, in fact, the conclusion is much stronger than hypercompleteness uh, under this assumption. Um, it will be the case that every object in this topos is the limit of its Posnikov tower, which not only implies hypercompleteness, but a bunch of other stuff, such as convergence of descent spectral sequences and so on. All right. Um, okay, so now this hypercompleteness theorem, um, let me rephrase it in a, oops, uh, well, in a more precise or stronger version. You have X QCQS scheme with valuative dimension uh, D, then the homotopy dimension of uh, the CDH, oops, of the CDH infinity topos is less than or equal to D. Um, and uh, once we know this, the previous proposition will apply because this infinity topos uh, is certainly generated by uh, representables, which are these uh, schemes of finite type over X. And uh, one of these, yeah, if you look at these properties of evaluative dimension, they will imply in particular that the valuative dimension of anything of finite type over X is still finite. Um, 
So this, this infinity topos is generated on the core limits by object finite valuative uh, or finite valuative dimension, hence a finite homotopy dimension. And therefore it's hypercomplete. Okay, so let me now say something about the proof of this. So now this is really the heart of the, this, this the proof of this criterion for Milne excision. It boils down to this fact. Um, let me assume that X is- Just a question about the statement of the theorem by Tuma. Uh, is, is, can you get an equality on the theorem? Just not an equality, not just an equality. Um, no, you cannot, um, because, for example, I mean, it's not true that it's it's going to be equal to me, and, and but it's kind of for stupid reasons because you can take x, uh, the Hanselian valuation ring, for example. So Hanselian valuation ring can have any valuative dimension that you want, but the dimension of the infinity of all the because it's a point. Thanks. Um, all right, so, so Dennis already mentioned this uh, riemann zariski space, and um, this is one of the ingredients in this proof. Um, so the riemann zariski space of X, by definition is the limit uh, over all proper birational maps to X of Y. Uh, so just take the limit of all proper birational modifications of X. It's not a scheme, but this is a, a locally ringed space. Yes, so sorry. Which is pretty close to being a scheme in many ways. Yeah. I mean, just to, to, to clarify, uh, you are taking the limit in the category of local ring spaces, nothing. Uh, yeah, all our ring spaces is the same because this is a filtered uh, limit. Sure, but you're not taking it in, uh, I don't know, sheaves or whatever. Right, just, yeah, um, it's a limit of locally ring spaces indeed. Um, right, and uh, well, as, as Dennis already mentioned, um, the valuative dimension of X is in fact the same as a cool dimension of this Riemann Zariski space. Um, so this is essentially some rephrasing of the of the definition, but okay, I mean I'm just going to take that for granted. Um, Sorry, Mark, can you repeat which maps y to x you're taking? I can read. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is the limit of all proper by rational maps. Ah, thank you. Sorry. Um, you could also take this limit of all blow-ups, all birational blow-ups, that would be the same locally ring space. Um, all right. So how are we going to estimate the homotopy dimension of this topos? So um, the key point is the following, um, is to construct a geometric morphism. from our topos of CDH sheaves to um, Nisnevich sheaves on the riemann zariski space of X. Um, right, so I mean, this, the main point is not to construct such a functor, there's kind of an obvious such functor you can write down, but uh, the non-trivial point is that it's actually geometric morphism by which I mean um, the left adjoint in a geometric morphism. So it's a functor that preserves core limits and finite limits. And why are these functors of interest to us? Because such functors preserve connectivity. All right, so recall that our goal is to check that this guy has homotopy dimension at most D. So that means you have to start with some deconnective sheaf in this topos and show that there exists a global section. So if you have a geometric morphism like this, you can uh, send your sheaf um, by this geometric morphism and uh, what you get will still be deconnective on the other side. And now the point is this guy, we actually know the homotopy dimension of this, or we have a bound for the homotopy dimension of this. 
Um, this one does have a material dimension less than or equal to D. So this is a result of Clausen and Matthew. Um, the fact that um, if you have a QCQS scheme of cool dimension D, then the homotopy dimension of the Nisnevich topos is at most D. Yeah, Mark, there is a question by Harry. Mm -hmm. Harry? Uh, yeah, um, I was wondering uh, if X were actually a ring, um, is this the same underlying space as the um, uh, attic spectrum uh, SPA RR? S P R R. So where you just take the whole ring as the sort of. No, I think it's S P A of R comma the fraction field. Uh, the second R needs to be a, a sub ring. Comma R. Yeah, so it's a fraction field. Okay. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's some sort of slice in this S P A R R. All right. Thanks. Particular, you cannot have valuations with kernels which I think is the point, if you know what that means. Yeah, so I mean, the point is these is valuations, their fraction field is always the same as the fraction field of X. Yeah, they cannot be, they cannot have yeah, some fraction field, which is some other, yeah, some other residue field. Um, yeah, so I mean, let me give you maybe some intuition about this. This thing, this thing here, what are we doing? So this is, this is analogous to the following situation, which may be more familiar with the et al uh, topos. So if you look at et al sheaves on some scheme X, okay, so the et al topos usually does not have finite homotopy dimension, but in some cases it has finite cohomological dimension and we can still use a similar strategy to, to estimate this cohomological dimension, namely, um, there, there is a geometric morphism to um, the topos of finite et al sheaves on any of the, the Hanselian local rings of X. Um, and uh, well, of course, this topos of finite et al sheaf is just the classifying topos of the Galois group of the residue field. Um, and you can use this geometric morphism to estimate the et al cohomological dimension of X in terms of the Galois cohomological dimension of the residue field. And why do we have this geometric morphism? In the et al case, it comes from the fact that, um, well, the et al topology decomposes in, in some specific way in the Nisnevich and finite et al topologies. Namely, um, if, you have any finite, uh, if you have any et al cover, it's always refined by a finite et al cover of a Nisnevich cover. And it's, it's this fact that tells you that this functor here, which I mean, you can define this functor anyway, but the fact that this functor preserves core limits is a geometric morphism is, is a consequence of this fact. And so this is completely analogous to what we have um, over here, the CDH topo. So the CDH topology also has the decomposition that, um, as follows, any um, CDH cover can be refined by an Isnevich cover of a completely decomposed proper cover. And these riemann zariski spaces, um, it turns out they are points for this completely decomposed proper topology in the same way that these um, Hanselian local rings are points in this Nevich topology. So it's basically why, um, well, why you might expect there to be such a geometric morphism and uh, in fact there is. Okay. So now, um, yeah. Okay, so now we can actually do the proof. So we start with some sheaf, which is deconnective in here. Um, uh, sorry, um, Mark, another question. Um, Harry is asking which paper of Clausen and Matthew has this, this story, has this? Uh, um, uh, it's uh, like hyperdescent and etal K theory. Something like that. Yeah, I mean, they don't have this exact statement with the riemann zariski space, but I mean, it's an easy consequence of what they prove in this paper. And sorry, how, how are you treating the riemann zariski space? I mean, how do you define the Nisnevich topology even? I mean, you can define the et al site and the Nisnevich topology. For example, just take the co-limit of the corresponding 
Misnevich sites with all the proper virational guys. That's one way. So you're treating it as some, as some kind of pro scheme. Yeah, exactly. So in fact, uh, what is so what is an object in here? An object in here is just a compatible collection of Misnevich sheaves of all the proper virational modifications of this. Okay. Um, right. So now. Um, as I said, because it's a geometric morphism, it preserves connectivity. And the, this infinity topos, we know it has a multiple dimension at most D. So that means that the image of the sheaf in here will have a global section. And what is the space of global section of the sheaf here? Well, if you, if you think about it, it's just the co-limits of, of the sections of all the proper virational modifications. This is a filter's co-limit. So if it's non-empty, that means that there exists some proper virational map. Um, where the sheaf is non empty. So this is what we get by, from this geometric morphism. Um, and then what we do is we form um, the abstract blob square. So we have this proper virational map. It's an isomorphism over some dense open. And we take a close complement Z and look at the fiber here, which is some sort of exceptional divisor. So this is an abstract blow up square. Um, and uh, this uh, close sub scheme Z doesn't contain any of the generic points of X. So one of the properties of evaluative dimension that we had tells us that the evaluative dimension of Z is strictly less than the evaluative dimension of X. And similarly, the evaluative dimension of E is strictly less than the evaluative dimension of Y, which is equal to the evaluative dimension of X. Um, and so this means that we can apply the induction hypothesis to Z and E. And the induction hypothesis tells us that F of Z and F of E are um, one connective um, or equivalently connected. Um, and um, right, and now the proof is basically concluded because, um, because F is a CDH sheaf, it takes such an abstract verb square to a Cartesian square. So F of X, which is what we're trying to show is non empty, is a pullback of F of Y over F of E of F of Z. And f of y and f of z are non-empty, and f of e is connected. So this implies that this pullback is not empty. OK, so this basically concludes this proof. Um, I, so I cheated in this proof by assuming at the beginning that x was integral, which is not really a valid move, because in the induction hypothesis, z will not be integral in general. So there is an additional step that you need to take care of the case when X is not integral in this induction, but um, um, yeah, that's not, um, I mean, this is really the main, um, the main argument in the proof. Sorry, Mark, can you remind again, why, why are you happy with having F of X non-empty? Uh, at the very end here. So sorry, yeah. what's the question? Yeah, like why, why are you happy at this moment? Oh, so we're, yeah, we're trying to prove that uh, this topos here has finite homotopy dimension. So that means that for any deconnective object, there is a global section. Oh, okay. Trying to prove that this is non-empty. That's the definition oh, okay. of the dimension at most. Thank you. Um, okay. Are there any other questions on this proof? Right, so I don't have that much time left, but I guess I can try to say something about um, the other part of the proof. So now we've reduced this question of mean excision to this question of the excision about valuation rings. Uh, we still have to do something about SH. Yeah? So up to now, this was all a very general results. And um, so yeah, okay, let me... Let me try to say something about this in the little time that I have. Um, 
Um, so we're looking at some uh, valuation ring, a finite rank. So I'm gonna draw a picture like this. Um, so I have generic points, the maximal ideal. Um, and we have, so uh, some prime P. So this, uh, so this is a localization at P and I will call it U. And this is a closed Z, which is the spectrum of B mod P. And I will also need a name for the open complement of this, which is T. So the situation is we have now open immersion T inside U inside X. Open immersion, um, give them some name as well, T and U. Important point is that this one is not an equality. Because the prime P is in U, but not in T. Okay, so what are we trying to show? We're trying to show that we have a Cartesian square of infinity categories like this. SH of X, SH of U, SH of Z, and SH of uh, the intersection, which is just the residue field at P. Um, We like this to be a Cartesian square. And so there's some formal things you can do from this to rephrase this um, in terms of some of these open immersions, T and U. Um, namely, this is equivalent to the following functorial statements. You have these functors, phi U lower shriek, T lower shriek, and there's a natural transformation to Q lower star, T lower shriek. So these are functors from SH of T to SH of X. And this equivalence to this natural transformation being an equivalence. So, I mean, this is more or less a formal deduction. I mean, using the usual uh, functorial properties such as localization and so on that SH has. And right, so there's always a canonical natural transformation from the lower shriek to the lower star for an immersion, which um, is because, so these functors, an open immersion, sorry. Uh, well, I mean, in this case, well, these functors are left and right adjoined to the pullback functors and they are also fully faithful. So you get the natural, there's this canonical natural transformation from the left adjoint to the right adjoint. Um, okay. Now the idea is uh, we try to check um, this equivalence here. Um, first at the level of pre-sheaves and then we go through all the localization um, that go into the definition of SH. And uh, so it turns out that, so if you look at this functor at the level of just pre-sheaves and smooth schemes, then in fact, this natural transformation is always an equivalence. Yeah. So this is some funny thing that happens with these evaluation rings. And uh, the, the problem with this strategy, however, is that you cannot, um, now you'd like to use the same, say for motivic space or for Nisnevich sheaves, and you have a problem with a Nisnevich localization, which is that push forward along an open immersion um, does not play well with, does not commute with Nisnevich sheavification. So even if you know this at the level of pre-sheave, you cannot deduce it at the level of Nisnevich sheaves. And um, yeah, so the solution to this is to replace the Nisnevich topology by the CDH topology. And so you can look at the CDH variant of SH, which is defined in the same way. And so if you start with smooth schemes, you get the usual SH, but if you do the same thing, started with um, X schemes of finite presentation and the CDH topology. So here you have the Nisnevich topology. Then you get the CDH variant of SH. And then um, it turns out that yeah, this functor here is fully faithful. So that is a theorem of Sisinski. And of course, it's closely related to the fact that SH uh, satisfies CDH descent. Um, 
And so using this fact, you can reduce, so you can easily see that it suffices to prove this result for the CDH version of SH here. So I can add some CDH here. And what we gain by this move is that now the CDH topology has this kind of miraculous property that um, push forward on an open immersion does commute with stratification. And what is it saying? So um, what does this boils down to is the fact that if you have a Hanselian valuation rings, which are the points for the CDH topology, and you take any quasi-compact open subscheme inside there, it's again the spectrum of a Hanselian valuation. Well, this is completely fault for a Hanselian local ring. If you take an open in a Hanselian local ring, I mean, it doesn't even have to be local, let alone Hanselian. So that's why open immersions don't play well with the Nisnevich topology. But the CDH topology fixes this issue. So now that we've made this modification, in fact, it does suffice to prove this equivalence here at the level of Cuishi. Because the CDH certification will play well with all these functors and all these functors also preserve a1 homotopy equivalences, so there's a non-issue, and passing to P1 spectra is also a non-issue. Um, yeah, so maybe I can write this follows from the same statement. From the category of pre-sheaves, okay, so you do have to be a little bit careful as to what kind of pre-sheaves you consider here. I consider pointed pre-sheaves. And this P sigma means um, these are the pre-sheaves that uh, transform finite sums into a product. Um, yeah, now this is a completely elementary question. I mean, you can just write down what this functor do on any given sheaf. Um, okay, I, since I guess I have three minutes, I might as well write it down and then um, it would be an exercise for you to check that this map is an equivalence. So, yeah, so I did, let me just start with some pre sheaf in here. So, what does this function do on such a pre sheaf? So, if I evaluate this on some y, so y is some scheme over x. Um, so this is a left adjoint to so a pullback functor. It's basically extension by zero, yeah, this lower shriek thing. So uh, this value is the same as the values of f when that makes sense and zero otherwise. So that means uh, it's f of y if, if y was already over this open t. And otherwise it's uh, contractible. All right, and now we can also compute the other functor and this one, well, what is the lower star functor? So this is the same as T lower shriek of F evaluated on the restriction of Y to U. And again, this is an extension by zero. So this is F of Y restricted to U if this lies over T and contractible otherwise. Okay, so there's one more fact that I need to tell you so that you can solve the exercise of checking that these two are the same. All right, so the claim, I mean, even though, you know, the right-hand side looks slightly different, they're actually always the same. And it's not completely obvious. In fact, to check this, you need some, some facts, which may seem intuitive, but is, is actually not so obvious, which is that if Y is connected, and which you can assume this is where the, this um, P sigma condition comes in. I mean, this P sigma pre sheaves are, are the same as pre sheaves on connected schemes. So you can assume that Y is connected. Um, then the image of Y in the valuation ring X is an interval in this. Um, yeah, in this specialized, this specialization process here. So the image of some connected scheme mapping to the spectrum of this valuation ring is always going to be some interval. And now using this fact, it's easy to check that this formula and this formula are actually always the same, just by going through all the possible cases of where this interval might, but where this interval might lie in this picture. Um, and yeah, I know that this fact here 
it's kind of a funny fact. It's definitely not a topological fact, you know, because every subset of evaluation ring is connected. So it's not, it's really an algebraic fact, something special about a connected scheme and mapping to the spectrum evaluation ring. Um, but, but it is true and it's also elementary to prove. Yeah, so this basically, I think, completes the proof of everything. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to mute everyone so we can thank him properly. Okay. Everyone again, and I'm muting Mark. So are there any questions? Quickly, that we are. Okay, ooh, there are questions. So another question by Harry. So let's go. Uh, yeah, um, just at the very end, uh, you showed that uh, this SHCDH of X like has really nice formal properties. And I was wondering, like, is there any reason why you don't just use that in general or uh, to, like for, for yeah, uh, material? It, it, no, it doesn't have very nice properties compared to SH. For example, it doesn't satisfy localization. Hmm. Well, that's a key. This is where the restriction to smooth schemes is uh, relevant for the, the classical definition. Uh, I mean, if you don't have localization, you can't really do much. I mean, yeah, over over bases that are not fields. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay. Another question by Ian Coy. Yeah. Or could you could you scroll up a little bit? Um, so you said, uh, yes, about the geometric morphism, up oh, down, sorry. So the geometric morphism from the CDH she used in his Navit sheaves. Um, I think I missed the why I'm not, you said like this shouldn't be very surprising because of the riemann zariski spaces are the, uh, are the points in that particular topology or something. Um, right, so I mean, I mean, everything I said is a bit just of intuition. I mean, making all this precise is not so straightforward somehow, but... Um, so can you, can you re-explain re -explain what the intuition was then? Yeah, it's a tall situation. And mm -hmm. the point is, so, so it comes from the fact that the CDH cover is refined by an Isnevich cover of a proper CDH cover. I see. So in... Yeah, analogous to finite et al and Isnevich for et al, and then using this, I mean, um, I think this is easier to see in this case that this decomposition of the etal topology implies that this functor, I mean, which is obvious, it's obvious what this functor is, you can just pull back to this Sensalian local ring and then restrict to the finite etal mm -hmm. site. You know? I mean, in general, restriction to finite etal sites does not preserve co limits, so that's not a geometric morphism. Yeah? But the point is because this decomposition of the etal topology is basically equivalent to the fact that the Sensalian local ring any et al cover is refined by a finite et al one. So, I mean, their the restriction to a finite et al site does in fact preserve co limits when you over and so on. And this is why this is a geometric morphism. So I see. An ID in here, where the Nevich topology is now replaced by the proper CDH topology, and the finite et al topology is replaced by the Nisnevich topology. So, there could be some, there probably is some general uh, topical statement you could make about when you can refine certain topologies by other topologies. I think so, yeah. But this is just two, two algebra geometric examples that we can get our hands on that are useful in this case. Cool. All right. But this, yeah, I mean, there's very often these topologies decompose in some way like this. Like the H topology also has some property like this. Um, I don't recall exactly what it is, but maybe FPPF and proper CDH or something like that. I mean, yeah, all these, uh, yeah, a lot of Bratton topologies decompose in this way. Yeah. But uh, of course, most of them don't have finite homotopy dimensions. So this is something which is a kind of a privilege of these completely decomposed topologies. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Uh, there is another question in the chat. Uh, could you, from Yu Feng? Could you please clarify again the difference between the two versions of, of the main theorem under H topology and CDH topology? Um, yes. It's very fast. Um, yeah, so the theorem, so if you want the H version of the theorem, you have to modify three things. First of all, so 
uh, oops. So here I'm gonna put H instead of CDH, okay? It's not surprising. And here I'm allowed to put absolutely integrally closed valuation ring, yeah? So it's an even weaker condition that you have to check. But you also have to, um, well, okay, you don't have to because of this theorem, because an H if is, in, well, okay, if you only, sorry, if you only knew condition two for AIC valuation ring, then a priori you would have to, this would only work if the category C was like a category of truncated objects with, with like a uniform bounds, such as um, truncated spaces or co-connective spectra, or things like that. So these are categories that have the property basically that every sheaf valued in them is always hypercomplete. Um, and you really need this because for the H topology, you don't have an, an analog of this hypercompleteness theorem. And I mean, this V excision condition is, is manifestly a condition about the stocks, right, of, of the sheaf. So um, if it's not hypercomplete, then you cannot hope to deduce anything from this condition. You know, unless you put yourself in a setting where every sheaf is automatically hypercomplete for trivial reasons. So this is, this is the setting of the Bat Matthew uh, theorem with the H topology. Okay, so there are a couple more questions, I think. A question, again, another question by Harry. Okay, hey, Dennis, wait a sec. Uh, let's, I think uh, Kirsten and Alma may be more, uh, oh. more in a hurry to ask a question. Okay, so sorry. Let's <laughs> um, unmute Kirsten. Uh, I yeah. I, I was um, wondering about cohomology theories with twists. So if you wanted excision for um, gluing together uh, like a cone, um, in oriented Chow. Um, so instead of a cohomology theory just mapping to a motivic spectrum, you could twist by some Tom space, but you might not want to twist by the pullback of a bundle from the cone point. You might want to twist by a bundle on the whole um, scheme you were interested in computing. So is the statement about these, this um, a functor to infinity categories, does it tell you about these cohomology theories with, with twist by bundles? Um, I mean, I, I think so, but I mean, I, I would say it comes from the fact that here you can, I mean, the, the, the scheme S can be anything. I mean, I, if you want to twist by some bundle, I mean, you still need to, I think, pick a bundle that works for all, you know, four thing. I mean, all four of these, these uh, rings, right, that are involved in the excision statement. So the bundle well, has to be defined over A, right? Um, uh, if any such situation and you have some bundle over A that you'd like to twist by, then yes, you will have excision because you can just apply this theorem with S equals spec A. If you wanted from the beginning, like you've made a cone by gluing together um, uh, pieces and you might want to twist by a bundle on the whole cone and it's probably Mommy. not going to be pulled back Mommy. from the cone Mommy. point. Sweetie. Um, <laughs> so there's some, some sort of compatibility maybe if you had uh, but the, but the a bunch of Right, but the point is the You have the bundle over the point. I'm listening. I think, I mean, I think in this case, the bundle yeah, is defined over the whole cone, but this is fine, right? The cone in this case would be like this, would be like this. Maybe. So you would apply the you would apply yeah, the cone is B mod I. Uh, I think the cone is B mod I. The cone is B mod I. Am I, am I backwards? Um, maybe I mean I'm not exactly sure. Oh, no, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, I, great. Okay. It might be, I, yeah, I apologize for stating this to the level of rings. It's very confusing. You have okay. to reverse all the arrow to understand what's going on. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Okay. Uh, let me, uh, okay. So, Harry, your last question for today, so for this morning. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, uh, the Bot Matthew paper has a sort of, converse to their uh, proof of excision. So the converse is, you know, if you are a V sheaf and you satisfy excision, then you're an arc sheaf. 
is there like another topology showing up in this situation or like does this actually prove that you're an arc sheaf as well? No, it would prove that you're a CD arc sheaf. It's a completely decomposed version of the arc topology. Mm -hmm. But to obtain this conclusion, you will need this, this boundedness assumption on the category C. Mm. So there's no avoiding that. But, um, and also, I mean, so you see have the CD arc topology, which, so satisfying CD arc descent is uh, stronger than satisfying an excision. But, um, yeah, but it's also much weaker than arc descent. Yeah, so arc descent has a lot of consequences. I mean, excision is one, but also things like formal gluing. Um, and uh, for the CD arc, there's not, I mean, mineral excision is really the main main thing that you can get from the CD arc topology. So, oh, so uh, you can formulate such a result with this topology, but it's not as potentially useful as the arc one, I would say. So uh, like to follow up really quick, um, uh, one of the things that's proved in that paper, if I remember correctly, is that um, the functor sending a ring to its um, small etal site or sort of, uh, or the version where you use algebraic spaces, um, that functor is a sheaf for the arc topology, I think. Um, and that target doesn't, uh, that target isn't, um, doesn't satisfy this, like everything is hypercomplete condition. Finding in, in I guess, sites or whatever. Yeah, it's a two category. Yeah. So everything is hypercomplete in the two. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. There you go. Thanks. Okay. Um, so let me check if there aren't any other questions. Uh, I think I can stop the recording and uh, declare the talk over. But first, let's thank the speaker again. And, okay. Let me stop the recording. Uh,